Yep, you're live on YouTube, so now you can just uh, start it. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the National Biodiversity Teach-In today. Today is National Day of Women and Girls in Science, and with us we have Dawn Baisley, and she's going to talk to about us about amazing Arctic plants. And people, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Frankie. Can you hear me? Can I get a sound check? Am yes, I we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, good morning, everybody, on this delightfully cold and chilly morning in Toronto, where it's about minus seven Celsius. Um, I think it's a polar vortex. So I'm really thrilled to be doing the National Biodiversity Teach-In for about the fourth or fifth time. It's been a few years now, um, and a huge shout out to Debbie and her amazing team of students and staff who have kept this series going over years now to bring scientists and activists and conservation biologists into your classrooms and homes. And um, this has always been an online activity to spread the word about science. And it's especially bittersweet uh, to be doing this in the second year of the coronavirus pandemic, which has hit so many of our friends and families. So I just want to acknowledge before we get started, a couple of things. I really hope that you're keeping safe and sound. Science has brought us vaccines in unprecedented times, uh, short times and uh, lots of vaccines, not just one or two. I have many colleagues who are cell biologists and immunologists and I talk to them weekly about the research and it is quite amazing. Um, I also want to take um, a minute here to acknowledge the importance of indigenous peoples, not just in North America, but globally. So I am sitting in Toronto, which is currently under the stewardship of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And this area is subject to a very particular dish with one spoon, um, wampum covenant, which was developed with the intention of protecting the Great Lakes region. So I'm here in Canada, but of course the Great Lakes region does include um, many parts of the United States, Michigan, uh, Superior, Minnesota. So welcome to you if you're joining from there. And today I will be talking about um, not the local First Nations where I live, which include the Haudenosaunee um, uh, and many, many nations, and uh, I'm honored to work with many of them, but the Inuit people of Canada. And I'll be talking about the Inuit homelands of Arctic Canada. So without much more ado, let me get started because I'm really hoping that there will be questions and it says someone says yes thank you so that's good that's in the chat we will check the chat I, I've been teaching now for a year on zoom so I'm like intermediate level zoom user uh, let me share my screen and we will get started uh, let's do this right so thank you for being here and share and start. Here we are. So 2021 National Biodiversity Teaching, which is more like international biodiversity teaching. Thank you, Debbie, and everyone that Debbie has brought along with her for this annual event. And uh, for the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, I just want to acknowledge that uh, we're not discovering uh, the role of women and people from equity seeking groups, whether people of color, black people, um, indigenous people, people from other equity seeking groups who have made important contributions, we're actually rediscovering the roles. Because I have gotten to work alongside a history professor looking at women and their roles and contributions to horticulture and botany, in Ontario, the province where Toronto is, in the last 120 years ago. And it turns out women were doing all kinds of things uh, in botany, 
but and they were recognized at the time and often what they did has been kind of lost from the record so when it comes to women and girls making contributions to science they've always been doing it you'll always find them there just have to look for them so i want to turn to amazing arctic plants and people and climate change and um, frankie can you give me a thumbs up if i'm doing okay you can do a reaction i'm just hoping i'm being heard so i want to cover in today's talk for all of you arctic ecology and biomes ethnobotany how people use plants and food security and you don't always think that plants are important in the arctic you think about like seals or caribou but plants are like really really important i'm going to be telling you some of the names of the plants in Inuktut, that's the broad range of Inuit dialects across the Canadian Arctic, but um, it will be Inuktitut, which is the language spoken in Nunavut. Uh, and this is a photograph of my teacher, Maina Ishulutak, who always tells me what a terrible accent I have. So apologies in advance, I'm going to be saying things wrong. And you can see her here with the traditional kudlik, the oil lamp, and I've got one behind me. I've got some props at the back that I'll show you. So we'll be doing some language teaching as well today and some Latin names, not just English. Okay, so Arctic and Alpine plant life forms are very recognizable because people are taller than the plants. And you can see here uh, my former student, Andrew Tannett Zapp, he is looking uh, standing on a mountain in Tromsø, Arctic Norway. He is standing on a snowpack in July and all around him are tiny, tiny plants. And in the top right of this photo, you can see um, uh, this cushion plant life form, which is very typical of Arctic plants. It's actually creating its own microclimate, believe it or not. And if you want to get uh, a good photograph of an Arctic or Alpine plant, which are tiny, you have to get right down on your hands and knees. And the man we can see lying on the ground is actually in his 80s. And um, he was on a trip, an ecotourism trip to the Arctic with a wonderful Canadian family owned company that I um, work with doing public science uh, called Adventure Canada. And uh, it was his lifelong dream to go to the Arctic and uh, learn about Inuit culture and see polar bears and learn about the tundra and I actually got him to lie down to take photos. We did a lot of stretching and he did get back up again with a little bit of help. So he got some great photographs and that's what you need to do. So the story of biodiversity on planet earth is the story of gradients. And these are gradients relating to altitude and latitude. And if we were able to beam from Toronto to the equator. And if we were then to walk either south towards the South Pole or north towards the North Pole, we would pass through these recognizable gradients of vegetation where things are kind of tra uh, changing gradually, but recognizably. So from the equator to the poles, Near the equator, we would be like in the um, sort of very rich rainforest with lots of species. I don't even know three of those species because it's so biodiverse. And then as we walk further north, we would hit a temperate deciduous forest, like what we're used to from the Carolinas and from uh, New England and Ontario. And then eventually, as you move further north, you'd hit the boreal forest, the largest continuous forest uh, in the world in terms of a global range. And then you'd then it would get really short, the vegetation, because no more trees uh, and you'd be in the tundra biome. And if you kept going, you'd get to ice caps. And of course, they're melting because of climate change. Likewise, if you were to start at the bottom of a mountain and go all the way up that mountain, you would also pass along an altitudinal gradient from low altitude at sea level to a higher altitude. And you would pass through zones of vegetation. And some of 
those vegetation zones would look a lot like tundra, kind of uh, high alpine meadows and these areas like up that mountain in Tromsø, Norway. You'd eventually reach a snow-capped peak. So this picture here is actually taken from a book by um, a long ago scientist called Alexander von Humboldt, who traveled the world and he was very interested in measuring ecosystems and he would invented all these pieces of equipment to measure temperature and other kinds of um, abiotic factors out there uh, in the in the ecosystem. And uh, he has had like got a penguin named after him, a current, a lot of universities, lots of plants, super famous guy. He lived to like a really long life to nearly 90. Um, and people say that if Charles Darwin had actually met him, Charles Darwin might have published his ideas on evolution sooner. Uh, because Humboldt had some of the uh, research that that would have helped Darwin to firm up his ideas sooner. So I've just talked about altitudinal upper mountain gradients and latitudinal gradients from um, uh, latitudes near the equator to up at the North and South Poles. And now I want to talk about another kind of gradient, which is moisture or wetness or precipitation gradients versus temperature gradients. And you know that if you are in a hot, dry place, you're going to be like in a desert. And if you're in a hot, wet place, you're going to be in a tropical rainforest. And if you're in a really cold, dry place, you're actually going to be on the tundra. And tundra is a kind of uh, polar desert. It's actually a desert environment with these tiny plants. So this is another kind of gradient. And these recognizable kinds of um, areas of vegetation are called biomes. Now, if you are watching from a high school, I am going to tell you something that your teacher might not have told you. And that's that it's OK to read Wikipedia. In fact, my biology students in plant ecology learn how to edit. They're currently doing assignments editing plant ecology pages on Wikipedia, which is an encyclopedia. Very easy to get good information. It's open access. People like me contribute to the articles. You just can't cite it in your essays because Wikipedia is like an encyclopedia. Uh, we would rather that you would reference a, a book or a journal article or something, but it's okay to read Wikipedia. Really, trust me. So a biome is a formation of plants and animals with common characteristics due to similar climates. And the same biome type can be found over a range of continents. So there's a desert in Africa, hmm. the Sahara Desert. There's a desert in Asia. Mongolia in the south has deserts, the Gobi Desert, I've been there. There's deserts in uh, North America, there's deserts in Australia, and they share similar characteristics of temperature, heat, and wetness, rain, precipitation. They're dry. Now I want to take you way up north to Canada, and you can see uh, Alaska over in the west in purple. And these are the Inuit regions of Canada the homelands, Inuit, Inuit Nunungat. And we actually have four different regions which uh, have self-government and land claims, which is to the west, Inuvialuit region, where you'll find Inuvik and uh, also Tuktoyaktuk, some of those communities. The central Arctic, which, including the high Arctic, which is Nunavut, which recently celebrated an important anniversary of the land claim settlement and self-government. And um, the main uh, administrative center is Ixaluit on Baffin Island. To the east of that, the northern part of the province of Quebec is called Nunavik. And then to the east of that, along the coast of Labrador is Nunatsiavut. That's the smallest uh, Inuit territory. And these areas are all above the perma, they're all in the regions of permafrost, uh, many of them in the Arctic Circle. Some are uh, subarctic but have tundra biome characteristics. 
Now I want to show you like a map of the world with different biomes and you can see all that pink stuff that is like the deserts. Um, and if we draw this gray line from west to east along this like latitudinal gradient that's the same latitude, the first thing that you can see is that gray color, which is the um, tundra, interfrost and permafrost zones. They come much further south in North America than they do in Europe and Asia. So all that gray on the eastern part of like Europe into Asia is Siberia. But you'll see that in Europe at the same latitude, it's light green, which is boreal forest and even some temperate forest like we see in like the Great Lakes region south, uh, New England, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin. Why is that? Well, a couple of things I want to point out to you. So the big blue star asterisky looking thing in North America is by um, some of the highest Arctic places. I've, I've been to just north of that where it really is ice cap polar desert. Yes, I've been to Greenland. And you'll see Tromsø, which is uh, in Norway. It's Arctic Norway. They have a fabulous university. If you ever have a chance to study in Norway, go to Tromsø University. Amazing. And then you can see that there is this brown arrow that I've got on the ocean. And that is the Gulf Stream. And it is bringing warm water to Europe. And that is causing warmer climates. So what that means, um, it says, oh, Donna, thank you, says, we have boreal forest on Mount Greylock in Massachusetts. Yes, you do, <laughs> you do. Um, I spent a great six months at Harvard Forest, central Massachusetts near Quabbin. Excellent place. Uh, okay. So here's Tromsø Botanic Garden above the Arctic Circle. And you can botanisk haga, that means botanic garden. And you can see it here, lots of tiny Arctic plants, lots of good signage showing warm water currents and cold water currents along the uh, eastern coast of Greenland. I always take photographs of signage and what is going on here. Ah, can you imagine my utter shock? to see the provincial flower of Ontario, where I live, huge border with New York State and um, Michigan, uh, Detroit. <laughs> you know where we are if you're in the Great Lakes region. Here's our temperate forest flower, the trillium, and it's flowering in the Botanic Garden in the Arctic in Norway. I'm like, whoa. And that's because of that ameliorated climate. But going around the botanical garden, you actually see the usual Arctic and alpine life forms. So if you go up the mountains that border the uh, city of Tromsø, you go up high in the alpine uh, uh, altitudes, not latitudes, you will get to that sort of tundra feeling. And what this growth form is known as is the hemicryptophyte, hmm, Latin roots. So hemi is partially, cryptophyte means hidden, crypto, like cryptocurrency, hidden. Um, and these plants are hiding their little buds that are going to turn into leaves and flowers at the soil surface where they are able to be protected by scale, snow and litter and their cushion life forms. And they actually create a modified um, microclimate in their cushion that is warmer than the outside air. They trap heat like in your down parka and they keep it a little bit warmer, which is better, of course, for the buds not to be frozen off. So hemicryptophyte says they're known are cushion plants with these buds at the soil surface and um, something called a phanerophyte has most of its buds and everything way above the soil and the ground, and that's also known as a tree. So camiphyte is, is, is another low-lying plant 
form that you find in the tundra. And this is one of the only graphs I'm going to show you. Bottom left, we see along the x-axis, that's the horizontal axis, the different plant growth forms from phanerophyte on the left to um, hemicryptophyte and cryptophyte and camiphyte. Uh, and the white bar is telling us that the percent, what the percentage of the total world flora is that is in that life form. So 50% of every plant that you see in the world is going to be basically a tree. And then you can see in the black, the percentage of the plant growth life forms that you'll see in Arctic alpine environments. And the black bar is tiny. There are really no trees in the Arctic, uh, the odd bush. Uh, most of the growth forms are these camiphytes, hemicryptophytes, and cryptophytes. Because if you grow above the snow, that minus 50 wind is going to just shear at you off. It'll freeze you to death, right? Um, so microclimates are really important. And this is a colleague of mine that I work with um, on Adventure Canada Arctic ecotourism trips where people are sort of combining learning about Inuit culture with a crash course in science. And Professor Lynn Mormon, who is a fantastic geoscientist and geomorphologist, always pointing out cool rocks and stuff. Uh, she's showing me this chert rock and I'm going, wow, look at the tiny microclimates that are like super protected. Uh, for the plants to grow in the cracks in the rock. So I said, you're a cryptobotanist because you're presenting as a geomorphologist, geoscientist, but you're really being a botanist by what you're showing me. She's like, uh, yeah, maybe. So here we are in the high Arctic, not the low Arctic, where there's quite tall vegetation in the low Arctic. Those willow bushes, they kind of come up to your waist. Now we're on Beachy Island, which is off um, Devon Island in the high Arctic. Um, and this is famous because the graves of sailors from the Lost Franklin expedition were always known about here. And in the last 10 years, with the help of Inuit guides and Inuit local knowledge, the, uh, the, the, the ships, the Erebus and Terror, were actually discovered. Uh, and you can, they're, they're, they're um, uh, marine archaeology sites now. And you can see that in amongst the rocks, it looks like there's nothing but like this pebble beach there. And in fact, there are flowers, these Arctic poppies and these little Arctic avens. And again, this professional photographer on our staff who's normally photographing these like amazing photos of um, like icebergs and stuff and uh, Arctic landscapes. And I'm going, hey, Andre, come over here because there's these awesome plants. That was my goal to get people to look at the plants. So natural selection has had a really strong effect on the vegetation, the flowers, the plants that can survive in Arctic biomes. And what I want to show you here is a person, Raoul Amundsen, who he adapted during his lifetime with his behavior and was a famous Norwegian Arctic and Antarctic explorer. And he kind of like brought people back alive because he actually lived in the central Arctic in uh, a town that today is called Joe Haven. Joe is the name of his, his ship, uh, one of his ships. Um, and he worked alongside the Inuit, the indigenous people, and he learned from them. So you can see in this statue in Tromsø, Arctic Norway, he's wearing a traditional Inuit parka and his trousers above his mukluks are made of polar bear fur. Um, so there's just, it, you know, to be Inuit is to learn how to survive in snow and ice and, and pass that knowledge on and share the knowledge as well. So that's an example of a human adapting. But over time, through natural selection, uh, plants adapt to their local environmental conditions. So in the top right here, you can see this beautiful spreading willow tree, temperate forest, my local park in Toronto, High Park, just gorgeous, you know, willow tree. But in the bottom photo, again, people lying on the ground. Okay, 
whenever you see a photograph of people in the tundra taking photographs of plants, they're always lying on the ground. You just have to do that. So this is a professor from the Netherlands who I used to know decades ago. And we were all together in Churchill, Manitoba on Hudson Bay about 10 years ago. And he's obscured by a willow bush. So that is also the same genus as that willow tree, but it is the tree in the low Arctic. So in the Arctic, what are the plants facing? Very short growing seasons. Here's me, by the way, before my hair went gray. This is about 40 years ago when I started doing field work. And we're actually setting up a camp in the middle of a river delta. And we're waiting for the snow geese to arrive, the lesser snow geese, because we're studying, they're nesting. I'm studying, they're grazing on the uh, uh, salt marsh grasses and this subarctic salt marsh. But right now I'm digging out trenches for the meltwater of this huge snowpack and you can see orange things in the back those are like the roofs of the shelters and the houses so there's like like 10 feet of snow it's just crazy but we're waiting for the vegetation to emerge and the growing season to get going and most of the uh biomass is below the ground in roots and most of the plants are perennials they don't really have time to be an annual and grow from a seed and you can see on the high Arctic here, this is Ellesmere Island where there's been some ice frost damage. And what you can see here is that when the ground kind of pulls away, there might be one little willow bush in like 50 meters by 50 meters, this big circle. But there's this massive root system underneath the ground. That's where the plants are. Um, so yeah, just to tell you where I was digging out those trenches, uh, when I about 40 years ago, I had an opportunity to go and be a field assistant to a graduate student who did her master's on snow goose grazing up um, near east of Churchill. And you can see Toronto here and uh, you actually can't fly directly. But if you could fly, it would be six hours and 20 minutes. For some reason, Google Maps gave me this. So we're actually not in Inuit Nunungat here, but it's very much coastal tundra vegetation. Very short. This is salt marsh grasses. And that um, little fence there is designed to be an ungrazed area because snow geese, they basically come in, they graze on the grasses. They're like sheep with two legs and white feathers and black wingtips. Uh, and we're studying what they're doing with the grazing and the way the vegetation is responding. Uh, so this is about 1,200 miles from the University of Toronto where I was a student. Uh, so I did two degrees there, a Bachelor of Science in Biogeography and Environmental Studies, and I stayed on to do my Masters of Science in Botany. And here's the field camp from like 40 years, actually this isn't 40 years ago, this is about 25 years ago, and I was recently up there a year ago, and it's changed even further. And one of the things that's really changed is all those willow bushes have gone because with the huge numbers of snow geese, they've literally grazed all the area around and they've exposed the soil to the sun and it's warmed up and the salts have pulled up from an ancient sea called the Terrell Sea and it's actually created saline conditions because uh, Hudson Bay is brackish. It's not very salty uh, and a lot of these plants are not salt tolerant. They're not halophytes. So a lot of them have died and you can actually see that damage from Landsat image, imagery, images. And you can see here me with some of, I'm on the left with a gun. There's another guy with a gun. He's now a professor at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. I think Sue Alton is a doctor and the woman on the right was my field assistant and she's a very senior person with Conservation Ontario. Uh, so this is us 40 years ago before we knew what we were going to turn into. I would have been like 2021. Uh, we have the guns because there are a lot of polar bears. Po uh, Churchill's known as the polar bear capital of the world. And that's what happens when you leave the camp without an electric fence and a polar bear comes to visit. Hmm. OK, fun, fun, fun. Short growing seasons. We'd be measuring the vegetation from around May to, and I would stay there till September. So and, and then it then it starts to turn fall and I'll show you pictures later. And uh, how can these Arctic plants uh, actually grow and reproduce? Well, the power of photosynthesis, which is what drives life on earth, a little current kept up by the sunshine. And you will know that leaves are little factories 
producing sugar, starch, proteins, amino acids, and nucleic acids. This is a textbook, a biology high school textbook from like the 1950s. And it's just awesome. I love this book. It talks about the leaf as a factory. I don't know who the workers are. No, they're not house elves. Anyway, um, the primary metabolites, those are the primary metabolites found in all plant cells. I'm just gonna click and go very quickly to something that all teachers need to take note of because you can really drive your students crazy with this. Hang on a minute. I love that song and I drive all my students in plant biology completely crazy with it. I'm just going to check the, um, there's not many questions. Keep those questions coming guys. If you have them, I'm going to go back to my talk. Hang on a minute. Uh, fun. Here we are. Here we are. Uh, the photosynthesis song. Yay. Okay. Let's see if I can. Okay. But chlorophyll is what makes leaves green because the green light is reflected and we have this wonderful photosynthesis going on and it's happening super fast in the Arctic in the summers, those short grown seasons. Uh, but there's actually a lot of other photosynthetic pigments masked by the green chlorophyll, uh, like reds and oranges, and they are accessory helping pigments for photosynthesis. So here we are back on Hudson Bay. The willow bushes are coming out of the snow. It's May, June. This is my friend, Kathy Martin, who studied willow ptarmigan. Um, you can see the goose exclosures protecting the vegetation coming out of the snow. And this mud here is what happens when the snow geese arrive, but the plants haven't started growing yet. So they're digging down into those roots where that's where the food is, kind of digging it up. Okay, I see that I got um, another, uh, let me see if I can see. Oh, there was a question. How do the plants survive the cold non-growing season? Hi, Jane. Okay, I will answer that a little bit later. We will get to that because it'll, it'll be how people are surviving as well. Okay, duly noted. Thank you, good question. So between July and August, the plants are growing really fast. Remember, we're in the high Arctic. The days are like 18 hours long. It's just sunlight, sunlight, sunlight. Photosynthesis, photosynthesis, photosynthesis. And they go to flowering in like six weeks. It's crazy. You can see the bright green uh, willow bushes. You can see the castellasia, the Indian paintbrush. It's beautiful. And then, the days start to get shorter and then we get the aurora borealis. It's a bit, a bit, it's all happening super fast. So autumn is coming really early. And in fact, you can see the microclimate effect here. So this is now the boardwalk in Ilulisat which is Greenland, which is the world's largest ice river that spawns all the icebergs that go out into the Atlantic. In fact, I believe this is where the iceberg that sank the Titanic came from. 
And this is August and you can see these, these red leaves. People were saying to me, Why, what are those pink flowers? And then I'm like, you're not allowed to step off the boardwalk because it's like a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So I'm like lying on the boardwalk, trying to look at this and get this photograph. I'm like, oh, it's leaves. Because what's happened is that growth from this blueberry, this Arctic blueberry has happened and then it's cold in the shade and it hasn't hardened off and it's going over. So now we start to see the plants are dying back. And in answer to Shane's question, the plants survive under the snow, the snow protects them as roots. Everything dies back to underground like bulbs, like, like tulip bulbs and they come up in the spring. It's exactly that. Um, and I see we have another question. Let me just check for that. Have you ever come close to a polar bear? from Lily many times. I'll tell you that story later. Remind me if I don't, I've had many encounters and I can tell you, I got some new glasses the other day. I've worn glasses since I was 11 or 12. These are new ones, which are really good. I got my prescription checked after three years because pandemic and I was like late. Um, these are like for um, seeing computer screen length. And, my story about the polar bear, one of my many stories, but probably the funniest one, because we were all safe, um, leads me to say, if you wear glasses, never go outside without your glasses, because you might mistake a polar bear for a dog that is the dog that finds the willow charming in this. More, more on that later. So here we are in Nanatsia, but, and you can see these beautiful colors. This is September. You can see the snow on the hills there. The um, willow is starting to go. The bearberry is turning red. These tiny berries, and there's berries everywhere. Oh, the um, on the rock we can see this lichen, which is not a plant, but it's a symbiotic organism of a fungus, actually several fungus, and um, photosynthetic algae. Super well adapted. Anyway, so if you're a plant in the tundra. Hmm, you have a really short time to grow and flower and produce seeds. They do produce seeds, but they do a few things that we don't think about. So reproductive strategies. On the left, vivipary. If you're a grass in the tundra, it's a really good idea to have the seed germinate and kind of hatch out into a little mini plant that can drop on the ground. Fistuca vivipara gives birth to live plants, not seeds. On the top, we can see this fluffy willow and it's gonna disperse the seeds. It's not waiting for an animal to move the seed around. It's gonna blow them around. That plant bottom uh, right is in the daisy family. It is producing flowers and seeds, but it doesn't need a pollinator because it's just gonna go ahead and produce a seed that is genetically identical to the mother plant. We don't need pollen here because we don't have time for that. But climate change is making longer growing seasons. And this is a 2006 map from the National Arbor Day Foundation showing the gardening zones. We have an extended one of these for Canada. And we know from data that gardening so zones are moving further north. You can't yet grow bananas here, but you know what? There's like um, the National Arbor Day Foundation actually amended its gardening zones to reflect more frost-free days uh, due to climate change, global warming. They did that like 15 years ago. And uh, what that means is that significant portions of many states in the USA uh, have shifted at least one full hardiness zone. So plants can survive there that 15 years ago, 20 years ago couldn't survive. Okay, and same for here, same for here. We are seeing a lot of plants showing up in Southern Ontario that are new plants from here, they're migrating north. So how do we know what's in the Arctic? Really easy. Okay, Arctic is a really good place to go and learn to identify plants because there's not much there. The biodiversity is low. There's tons of biodiversity in the tropical rainforests, not so much up in the Arctic because it's so harsh. So how do we know? We have these books called Floras, vascular plants of continental Northwest territories. Um, Lots of lovely field guides, like the wildflowers of Greenland. Really easy, look at a picture. People say to me, how do you identify a flower you don't know? I go, I look at the pictures first, then I key it out like a botanist. And these identification guides have pictures of the plants, they have maps to tell you where to find it, um, where it will be found. There's about 500 native species 
um, in Greenland, and there are some non-indigenous, uh, somewhat invasive species, including Icelandic poppy. Uh, so three different ways that we identify plants. I'm going to wind up now. Actually, we're nearly at the end, so I can take questions. Uh, three kinds of documents, floras with lots of technical terms, field guides, they're shorter, local plant lists. There's always a local expert who can help you. Um, flowering plants, we have those. We also have ferns and mosses, which are uh, plants, but they produce little, little um, spores. They don't produce flowers. And here are some pictures of the symbiotic lichens, like the orange xanthoria and reindeer lichen. And here's some more crazy looking lichen, like the birds, the, the finger lichen, and this weird lichen on the top right. Um, oh, I hope you can hear me because it says my internet connection is unstable. Um, and then this beautiful golden lichen. There's also a lot of algae. You can see on Ellesmere Island, this is super rugged looking like a desert, but it's got green algae and bacteria and they're bubbling up. Uh, so lots of ways to learn the species. And what about people and plants? The Inuit are up in the Inuit Nunungat homelands. Well, I do not like the second year botany textbooks definition of ethnobotany because it says it's the study of the uses of plants for medicinal and other purposes by indigenous peoples, uh, which kind of implies that only indigenous people use plants, but we all use plants and herbs. You know, Plantago major, major uh, common plantain was brought to North America by English, English people because it's a herbal and it was known by First Nations as Englishman's foot because where Englishmen went, that was where the plant followed them. Um, so yeah, lots about Inuit botany, uh, Inuit uh, botany and ethnobotany and uses of plants. So the Inuit, I'm just checking for questions. Um, how many different plants would you say are in the Antarctic? Not very many, I think about 50. <laughs> There's like a big ice sheet there, way fewer than the Arctic. And of course, no people. So what is the Aurora Borealis? Uh, the Northern Lights, where you get these electrostatic um, pulses in the upper atmosphere that are like green and purple. And there's also the southern northern lights in the Antarctic. They're magical. They're amazing. Okay, sorry, I'm just going to go back to this slide here. Uh, so in the Inuit, and this is my friend Jen, who I worked with as well in her traditional um, Amauti. Uh, she had a baby, so I don't work with her much anymore uh, a few years ago because she's at home looking at, 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 she works, but she's a working mom, but with a, with a little one. So the Inuit use plants as food, medicine, material and technology. Traditional beliefs is important for plants. Uh, plants are important for traditional beliefs in association with animals, sled dogs, story and song, arts and crafts, and just enjoying wildflowers, gardening. So plants are providing a lot more than food security. And I'm going to show you the kudlik, the traditional oil lamp, uh, which would be, um, it would be fueled traditionally by seal blubber. But the wick is made, and I've got a lighting kit here by, that I bought in the central Arctic near the Northwest Passage. Uh, either It's a mixture of moss and, um, willow flowers, or it could be cotton grass, which is very fluffy, like a cotton bud. And you can see this lady here who is in Pond Inlet, Mitamatlik, uh, has got the traditional lamp lit and in the snow houses, which you might have known as igloos, but they're really snow houses because igloo means something, it, it's more than a snow house. Um, the wick would be this traditional uh, plant wick there'd be blubber, that is Crisco oil in there, I can tell you, or olive oil. I, I run my oil lamps with olive oil um, and paper towels as the wick. Uh, and that oil lamp would be used to keep everyone warm in the winter as a source of light in the dark winter nights when everyone is hunkered down, including the plants under the snow surviving, um, and also to cook. So plants are used throughout the year, even though they're only growing for a little while. So grasses, there are no trees to make willow baskets in the Arctic, but lime grass is used for woven baskets. And you can see the basket up here. And the, uh, this is beautiful, 
the art of basket weaving has been revived. It was kind of lost um, and now it's been revived again. And I've got things I've got things in here to show people. OK, um, so that's a cool thing. Arctic willow. Oh, let's see. So lime grass, the Inuktitut name is Ivigak, Ivigak, Ivigak. The names vary across the Arctic. Arctic willow used for the wicks. Ukpi stuputilu, uh, which means to put it are the fluffy stem seeds and ukpi are the woody stems. And it is used uh, in many ways. Guess what? Aspirin is a plant secondary compound that is extracted from willows and used to treat headaches and other things, um, you can just chew a leaf and the Inuit do that. So traditional Arctic food, let's talk about that. Um, normally we think of the Inuit as primarily eating meat, which is very important and that provides vitamin C. And you can see um, uh, the, the attendant when we were in Mitamata, like in the library with his two little boys, this beautiful seal skin, um, vest with the narwhal in it. And top right is a colleague of mine, Ayu Peter, who's very famous. She's a lawyer and a filmmaker and an actor and a politician and an activist, introducing people who are ecotourists to traditional country foods. Everything from um, uh, muktuk, from narwhal to seal. So everyone tries it. Okay, for those of you who know about Tim Hortons and coffee shops, uh, there is the northernmost. Tim Hortons is in Mitamatalik Pond Inlet. But it's expensive because it's so far north. So food security in the Arctic um, means that uh, Inuit really need to rely on local foods because here is a can of Heinz tomato juice uh, in the northern store. That's the supermarket up in Nunavut Pond Inlet in 2016, nearly 20 bucks Canadian. That same uh, can is two dollars and 40 cents in my local no frills so this is a huge issue and and plants are part of that so there's a lot of gathering of in this case also known as arctic blueberries also i probably just said that wrong which is crowberry that'll strain stain your teeth um black and blue. It's not as sweet as a blueberry, but it is an important food that is stored for the winter. Probably the queen of berries, I would say, is the cloud berry, known as the akpik or akpit, plural, and the Inuvialuit and other Inuit, uh, uh, people in other Inuit regions are really careful about harvesting this because only one berry is produced by Rubus camomorus per plant, keeping an eye on Q and, Q and A. Oops, sorry. Um, let's see if I can. Okay. Um, do they ever get to eat pizza? Yeah, they love pizza. Yeah. <laughs> they do. Yeah. <laughs> they I have do. a question from the YouTube channel as well. And the question says, have you been able to do your studies this year with COVID? Do you have to worry about that? So in 2020, everything was canceled. Um, so let's talk, um, his cloudberry, I'm just gonna leave this here because it's a beautiful cross stitch and I do cross stitch. And you can see yellowberry, salmonberry, bake apple, laco, hyotron, malta, all over the Arctic, Swedes, Norwegians, everyone hoards cloudberry. If you get to Ikea, you can sometimes buy a jar of cloudberry jam, string the seeds out, it's a bit seedy. But let's talk about coronavirus for a sec. Um, because of the lack of health infrastructure in the Arctic, um, Canada closed off access to the Arctic very early in the pandemic. So I was actually supposed to be there in 2020, uh, being an Arctic botanist on ecotourism trips. And my younger daughter was supposed to be doing her master's research in the high Arctic and that all got canceled. We just heard last week that again, none, none of that will happen, at least for the shipping. Uh, tourism and going in by ship. Um, there have been a few cases in Arviat um, and other um, Inuit communities north of uh, Churchill on the west side of Hudson Bay, and they um, were, were, were contained within uh, family groups because everyone was inside, and we know that's how SARS-CoV-2 spreads. So um, there's been pretty much lockdown where there were one or two cases 
it was somebody coming home, traveling, and for the rest of us, it's not a thing. So we're having to do other things um, and we really want them to be safe. Okay, so that's really the situation. Um, there, We don't know for uh, graduate students whether they'll be able to get into the more remote regions this year, but certainly uh, shipping traffic, not a thing. I just heard that. Okay, so cloudberries, part of the whole berry culture, fabulously delicious, keeping an eye on the time. Um, other veggies out there, mountain sorrel, hunglit, delicious. You can, very lemony. I love it. Um, scurvy grass that sailors would eat and collect for salads when they landed isn't really much of a thing uh, in the for the Inuit because um, I actually think it, that that hunglit is tastier. I've eaten both. <laughs> okay, dwarf fireweed. Ah, oh, the national flower of Greenland, known as pownite. You may know fireweed from uh, where you live because there's quite a lot of it uh, down here. But this is tiny one with a huge flower, delicious. Caminarian latifolium, pow nut, you could totally edible. Seaside bluebells, siuruapukayangit, okay, I'm doing really badly. Mertensia maritima, Latin name, delicious everywhere on the coasts. Like it's so yummy. Okay, if you wanna learn about Arctic plants and people, there has been in the last 15 years, a huge amount of work with elders and ethnobotanist collaborations to document the ethnobotany. This is a beautiful book called Walking with Alasi, and you can see the Inuktitut syllabics. Um, Alasi Jomi is an Inuit elder and she writes about growing up with plants and it was updated in 2019. It is widely available for school libraries uh, it is a brilliant book. It's bigger. It's been expanded. It's got recipes. If you don't have it for your library, um, I would say try and get it for K to eight. Finally, I'm going to wind up there and take questions. Sorry, I was a bit long because I was digressing, but you can get this great background uh, Encyclopedia Britannica by my colleague, David Klein, who's long retired. I knew him when I was a grad student at the University of Alberta, of Alaska. And I made a v vlog about talking with Inuit artists, carvers and jewelers and how to support them and learning about all this cool stuff that I have, like my earrings, which are like sleds cut from narwhal ivory or this amazing walrus shaman polar bear carving. Um, yeah, you can do that. I will put that out there and take some questions because I think we need to finish. I'm gonna actually stop the share, okay. Right, can I stop the share? Are there any questions? I am done there. Um, Melanie is reminding you to share your polar bear, um, polar bear story. Okay. Thank you, Melanie, can you see? So I was always the first person when I was a grad student and undergrad to go out uh, of the bunkhouse. And um, we had two dogs. Jenny and Tasha, who are English setters who helped to find the nests uh, of the um, ptarmigans so that the eggs could be weighed and the chicks could be marked and that stuff. And they were like these adorable, mainly white dogs with tiny black splotches or reddish brown splotches. And they would sleep in um, boxes at the head of our uh, foot and head of my bunk bed. And in the upper bunk would be my friend and colleague, Kathy Martin, who was their owner and doing her PhD. So um, I would go out with my toothbrush and I'd often be the first person, put the coffee pot on and I wouldn't often not wear my glasses. So I'd go to the edge of the island, <laughs> dip my toothbrush in the river because it's all super clean, no beaver fever or anything. Um, put toothpaste on, like be brushing my teeth. And I'd be in my nighty, go out. And one time I went out and I could see in the, out of the corner of my eye, like this white shape moving around. I thought, oh, Tasha or Jenny, one of the dogs must have like got up when I got up and, and I'm like brushing my teeth. Then I go back in to the bunkhouse and I look at the two boxes and I see two dogs and I'm like, what was that white thing out there? So I put my glasses on and I run out. There's like this polar bear 
<laughs> and there's like 10 field biologists sleeping. That was before uh, we got, they put electric fences up because they were staying, the, bio, the scientists were staying longer into the season. No, most scientists were leaving by the time the, the snow geese migrated at the end of July. And then there weren't so many polar bears which congregate there at the end of September to go back out onto the sea ice to hunt seals and stuff. So after that, the rule for me was always wear your glasses. So you can spot the polar bear and not mistake the polar bear for an English setter, whitish dog. Sorry. I have lots of other stories, but that's kind of the funniest. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, we have some questions. Try and do them. Yeah, uh, did I ever see a narwhal? Don't forget your polar bear story. Tim Horton and Calabri's magic. Nice, thank you. Did I ever see? You know what? Narwhal are really difficult to see. And I did once after many, many trips. Oh, yeah. You just kind of <laughs> see these things in the water. Hard to spot. Okay, um, Frankie. Um, well, we thank you very much for your time. Yeah. I think so. It's 10 o'clock. So we thank you very much for your time and for teaching us about Arctic plants. We hope to see you again next year. Likewise, Have a good day. And, uh, I wish you all to stay safe and sound and listen to the science. Yes, you Wear as well. Masks. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.